March 15th. It's weird, but that date is locked in my memory. That was the first Sunday that we were unable to run our worship services in person. And I, I think a date was seared into my mind because for weeks and weeks afterwards, I would come to the office and in the kids' area, I would see the check-in sheets that were still out on the tables for that morning. It was like a moment frozen in time, a reminder that we were meant to gather that day. Man, March 15th, 2020 feels like a lifetime ago. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I get this reaction within me when people start talking about the pandemic. I, I just wanna shout like enough, enough. I've had enough of this. And I know it's not over, but I'm just exhausted of having this ominous pandemic looming over every area of my life. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of hearing about it. It just feels like this heavy cloud has settled over us and I'm just trying to reach and scramble for the end. 427 days. That's how long this cloud has been looming over Lakeview. Remember we thought it might be a few weeks, maybe a few months, and then for real, it's just kept going. And I'm thankful that some sense of end is in sight, but have you ever wondered, like, what would you do if this just like kept going, like for a long time, like for years? What would we do? How long would it take for the new normal to just become normal? It's interesting because I never would have wondered about those kind of things before. But now that I'm walking through this season, I'm finding that it's forcing me to see things a bit differently. And it's actually allowing me to read the story of the Bible differently. Usually when I read the narratives of the people of Israel, the timelines can be hard to relate with. But I wonder if this pandemic can help give us some perspective. We've been in this mode for 14 months. Maybe we can layer that onto the history of Israel to see if it can help us relate with their plight. A few weeks ago, Allison tracked out a helpful timeline of the Old Testament. Let's zoom back into that story and trace the steps that lead us up to the time when Habakkuk shows up. In many ways, the golden years of Israel came around the reign of King David and King Solomon around 1000 BC. Now, times were not perfect, but Israel was established as a kingdom nation. They had a capital to be proud of and a majestic temple to worship in. In particular, during the reign of Solomon, the economy was booming and times felt good. But right after Solomon died, around 925 BC, the nation essentially fell into civil war. There was a rift between the northern tribes and the southern tribes, and there was a movement to establish a counter kingdom in the north. So the kingdom splits into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And for the Israelites, the division of the kingdom meant not only military unrest within the nation, but the nation was definitively weakened against attacks from neighboring nations. And if you've read the narratives of First and Second Kings, you know that these days were marked by corrupt leadership and rampant immorality among the people. This period of civil unrest lasted for 200 years, 73,000 days. And it did not end with the reunification of God's people as one nation. No, the northern kingdom of Israel was crushed by the Assyrian Empire in 720 BC, leaving the southern kingdom of Judah alone and vulnerable amidst the military powerhouses that surrounded it. And now Babylon has defeated Assyria and is extending its empire all throughout the region. By the time Habakkuk is on the scene, it's probably sometime around 600 BC. 120 years have passed since the northern kingdom was destroyed. 320 years since the kingdom was divided. 116,800 days. I wonder what kind of changes the people went through amidst all those challenges. Like how long did it take for the strange new realities to just become the way things are? I know it doesn't make anything easier, but it does put 14 months 
into perspective. And see, we find ourselves at an interesting moment in our journey. We hope, and in Saskatchewan at least, the worst of the pandemic is behind us. We can't be sure what the future holds, but it feels like we are on the cusp of a new season. Habakkuk and the rest of Judah, well, they were also on the cusp of a new season, but there was not much hope in their future. The looming threat of Babylon was over them. Things were going to get a lot worse before they got any better. And in the midst of that space, Habakkuk is waiting, waiting for a word from Yahweh. I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I'll wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Write this down. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick moment and embarrass my good friend, Aiden Mari. I didn't tell him I was gonna say this, but he edits all our videos, so if he really wants to cut this, he can make it happen. So back when I was living the dream as a youth pastor, a young Aiden Mari wandered into my life as our youth intern. Dude was ambitious, passionate, and eager to take over the world for Jesus. And one of the things I remember from the early days with Aiden is we would have these awesome meetings. We would dream up all kinds of amazing ideas, and I leave those meetings really stoked for all the awesome stuff that Aiden was going to get done. And he definitely did really great work, but on a few occasions, some pretty important stuff would get missed. That's fair. Dude is young, he's new at this. So I tried to help him by encouraging him to bring a notebook to our meetings, you know, to write stuff down he said he was going to do. So I remember on a few occasions, young Mari and I would be in the zone cooking up all kinds of great stuff and I'm giving him all kinds of tasks and he's just like nodding his head like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I realize his notebook is empty. So on a few occasions, I'm like, dude, write that down, right? Because you need to remember this stuff later. In a similar way, God is like, hey, Habakkuk, get a pen, write this down. Don't miss this. You and your people are going to need to remember this later. He says, make it plain on tablets like a herald can run with it. Make it short and punchy so that a runner can easily carry it with them and share it with others. God wants to make sure that Habakkuk and the people of Judah grasp a clear central message. And what is that message? Well, Yahweh continues on. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave, and like death, they're never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. But soon, their captives will taunt them. They will mock them, saying, what sorrow awaits you thieves? Now you will get what you deserve. You've become rich by extortion, but how much longer can this go on? Suddenly, your debtors will take action. They will turn on you and take all you have while you stand trembling and helpless. Because you have plundered many nations, now all the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. What sorrow awaits you? Okay, okay. Hold the phone. What is going on here? Like Yahweh says, grab a pen and write down this clear, simple message And then he goes on railing against the evil ways of the people. And he's going to keep going for another 10 verses. I cut it off, but there's all kinds of woe to you and warnings. Where's the simple message for the tablet? It's easy to miss because it's basically sandwiched in the middle of God's rant. Let's take a look again at those first few verses. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave and like death, they are never satisfied. 
In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. Do you see it now? The righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. At first, this feels buried to me and hard to spot, but when you contrast this message against everything else around it that God is saying, it actually starts to pop off the page. God is calling out the proud, the greedy, the arrogant, the oppressors, the unjust, the violent, the depraved. And amidst his woes and warnings, he declares, the righteous will live by faith. That is the message that Yahweh wanted Habakkuk to hear and to record and to declare among all the people. Amidst the desperate season Judah was in, worn from the journey behind them, weary for the path ahead, this was the word that God wanted them to hold tightly. The righteous will live by their faithfulness. It's a word that offers instruction for people who long to be righteous amidst the society that's unraveling around them. It's a reminder to remain committed to God and follow his ways, to hold off against the pressures and temptations of the evil that was pervasive around them. And it's a word of encouragement to a people who are going to face untold challenges in the journey before them. Stay faithful. It's the key to righteousness. Even though this message seems to be somewhat buried, tucked away in this small book written by a forgotten prophet, the significance of this message was not missed. The writers of the New Testament recognized the centrality of this word from Habakkuk. You see, righteousness, it has to do with the way we live our lives. Are we living rightly? Are we on the right track? But righteousness also has to do with our standing before God. Are we considered righteous before God? Are we in good standing with God? And for many Jews, they understood obedience to the law as the key to righteousness. Following the commands would lead to the right kind of life. Following the commands would ensure that they were in good standing with God. But Paul understood that while obedience is important, faith is the key. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. Faith is the key. Trusting in God, believing in who God is, and what God has done for us. This is the key to discovering the right way of living we are made for. This is the key to our standing with God. We are set right with God, not because of what we do or how hard we try or how closely we follow the rules. We are set right with God because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. We are set right with God by trusting that God has made salvation available to each of us. This is the good news, the gospel that Paul was on a mission to declare wherever he went. As he writes in the letter to the Romans, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Faith is the key to accessing the life that we were all made for. Trusting and believing in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the center of our lives. It is the source of our hope. And the author of the letter to the Hebrews reminds us, that, that faith is key to accessing righteousness. It's like the doorway we enter through. But faith is also the path we continue on. The author is writing with a word of encouragement to remain faithful, despite the challenges that these early Christians were facing. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. 
Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken away from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there are better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Did you catch all that the Hebrew Christians were up against? Public ridicule and beatings, getting thrown in prison, having their possessions taken away. It's no surprise that the author of the letter to the Hebrews makes a connection between the situation that those early Christians were in and the situation that Habakkuk and the people of Judah found themselves in. Pressure is mounting from all sides. Energy is waning. Their numbers are dwindling. People are falling off, giving in, giving up. To the people of Judah and to the early Christians, the message remains the same. Keep the faith. Don't turn away. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't be among those who've turned away from God. You get the sense that the author of Hebrews is writing to a group within a larger group. Among the broader community, there seems to be some who've fallen off, fallen away. And this core group within the larger community is being encouraged to hold steady. Don't fall off with the others sounds very similar to what was happening in Judah at the time Habakkuk was writing. Throughout their journey into exile, the theme of a remnant is going to become very important. The remnant was this core group of Israelites who remained faithful to Yahweh despite all the hardship the nation went through. Even though many turned away from Yahweh, a remnant always remained. And it's to the remnant in Judah and to the remnant in the early church that the encouragement to keep the faith is given. Anyone else out there feeling a little bit like you're part of a remnant? This message is for all of Lakeview Church, but we all see the little head count, don't we? Remember when we used to gather together with 600 people on Sunday mornings, declaring the promises of God and singing his praises together? Remember when we used to have like 150 households logging in to be a part of our online services? I don't know how many of us are logged in today, but I know like last week there was about 60 households who logged in. I'm not saying this to throw shade on anyone who isn't tuning in. I know that there are many people who remain committed to Lakeview, even if we don't see them say hi in the chat. But I can say honestly that This has been a really discouraging season. And not because I'm one of the pastors, but because I'm a part of this church family. And it hurts to feel like our community has been disrupted. I am encouraged knowing that things are getting better and one day we will be able to meet together in person. But I'll be honest. I don't know who I'm going to see when we gather again. And I don't know who I'm not going to see. And if you're feeling anything at all similar to me, please understand there is a message for us. There was a message for the remnant in Judah. There was a message for the early church. And there is a message for us. Hold the faith. Walk in faith. Do not give up. In this season, we need to let that message hang over us like a banner. We need to write it down. We need to carry that simple message with us and let it spread among us. 
It needs to become our rallying call. It needs to be our reminder when we are discouraged, when we feel alone, when we feel like our church community is crumbling around us, we need to be among those who say, no, we will hold strong. We will hold the faith. We will remain committed to Jesus. We will remember his ways. We will declare all that he has done. And we will continue to believe that he has not done his good work in Lakeview Church. And there will be some who fall away. But let us not be among them. Let us not shrink back. Let us not forget our God and all that he has done. Let us not forget who we are. We are his people. Let us not forget that we are a part of his family and his family needs us. Let's hold the faith. I say to us, those of us who are here today, who are logged in, who are watching, who are listening, who keep showing up, Let this message be a banner over our lives. The righteous will live by faith. And yeah, there are disruptions to the way we exist as a church. And there are probably going to be more unexpected disruptions ahead. We're going to need to be creative. We're going to need to ask ourselves big questions about what it actually looks like to remain faithful in these times. We're going to need to keep reimagining what it looks like to stay connected as a faithful community. The remnant in Judah, they found a way to keep the faith. The early church, they kept the faith. Lakeview Church, it's our turn. Keep the faith. If you're anything like me, that's actually been incredibly hard this year. I found that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, things were actually great. I had a ton of time at home that I usually didn't have, which meant a ton of time to do the things that I knew I needed to do. I spent tons of time in prayer, reading my Bible, watching sermons, listening and reading books. And as time has gone on, that has slowly decreased. And more and more, I have begun to watch the news watch TV, stay up way past when I should, sleep in way past when I should, eat unhealthy, you name it. Um, I, I won't say that I've been keeping the faith well. And I feel like that's a lot of us. And, and, and the problem with that is, is that um, we actually need discipline in our lives. In the last two weeks, I decided I was going to take up golfing. I haven't golfed in years, and I wasn't very good when I even did golf. But I needed a hobby. I needed something to do, something to get me out of the house, so I decided to take up golf. Um, and so I thought, what, what a better way to get some practice in and see how good I am than to get a driving range membership. And so I did that, and I went to the driving range, and boy, oh boy, the first time I went up to, to hit those clubs, it was not pretty. I was shooting things not very far and often really far to the right. In fact, there were a couple times where I looked over to the people beside me and I was like, I'm sorry, (laughs) because I almost hit them. It was pretty ridiculous. But as time has gone on over the last two weeks, I've had a chance to go to the driving range four times as of recording this. And you wouldn't actually believe the progress I've made in such a short amount of time that having the discipline of of getting myself out and doing the thing that I knew I needed to do to get better at golf, which was to actually hit some golf balls with some clubs, uh, actually helped. And so I've gone from hitting it only like 50 to 75 yards really far to the right to actually usually being able to consistently hit it straight or just a little to the left or to the right and hitting 150 yards. Now, just because I have this practice of going and practicing my golf in my life, it doesn't mean that I, I always show up and am significantly better than I was or I don't drop the ball often. In fact, the last time I went, I had a really rough time. I hit more dirt than I did golf balls, and I, I, I actually hit 200 yards. But other than that, I, I was either hitting too much of the ground or too much of uh, the top of the ball and, and couldn't get it right. But I know that if I continually show up and do this discipline, do this practice, that I will grow in my skill in golf. And so this week, I'm calling us to do something similar. Um, I'm calling for us as a community to actually have disciplines that help us 
keep the faith. Because if we don't have these disciplines in our lives, especially right now, we are going to go up to, to the T and we are going to swing our club and we're only going to go about 50 yards. We're going to go really far to the right and it's not going to be good. That we actually need these disciplines and practices in our lives to actually be healthy, to actually make spiritual progress, to actually just be healthy human beings who aren't depressed all the time. And so these practices, this group of practices that I want to encourage you to take on is something that we call a rule of life. This is a a thing that we invented as Christians a long, long time ago, way at the very early stages of Christianity. And it's something that Christians have been doing for thousands of years at this point. And what it is, is you essentially make for yourself several rules that you are going to live by. You're going to make a rule for life. And, and, and the thing about these rules is, is they are supposed to be things that you try to stick through throughout your day or week so that you are continually making progress in your spiritual walk with Jesus, but then also just in your personal life in general. And so I recently, along with adopting a practice of golfing, have actually adopted my own rule of life. Um, And I want to share it with you. And this isn't original to me. I didn't make this up. I actually found this from a church that I really respect and and look to for for some guidance for different things for spiritual practices. And it's a church called Bridgetown Church. And when COVID hit, um, they they started doing this rule of life as a church together. And, and, and I wish that I started doing it with them because in the two weeks that I've been doing this rule for life, I cannot tell you the amount of spiritual growth, but also just like calmness and, 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 and joy that has filled my life again. So here are the different things that this rule of life is asking us to do. Number one, start the day in quiet prayer and scripture. Start the day in quiet prayer and scripture, reading before anything digital like Instagram or the news or television. If you have kids, ideally this will be before they wake up. Simply just start the day in quiet with God. Number two, create a gratitude ritual. Draw your attention to the things for which you are grateful. Perhaps you write them down each morning or share them with your family or friends around the dinner table in the evening. Number three, exercise or go for a walk. If at all possible, while maintaining proper social distancing, exercise or go for a walk through your neighborhood. There is something to engaging in this space in your body to stay grounded with God. Number four, one focal practice. Find an activity, like golf, in which you are able to give your complete focus without getting distracted or finding yourself concerned about the conditions of the outside world. This can be gardening, woodworking, cooking, reading, art, chess, etc. Number five, relational touch point. Establish a relational touch point with a close friend, family member, or your community buddy. This is a time to draw closer relationships through the benefit of technology, not grow more distant. Number six, limit intake of news. The news cycle moves at a rapid pace, but our internet tempo is not meant to live at that speed. Limit your intake to two times daily. Consider setting an alarm for once in the morning and once in the evening. Number seven, limit screen time and escapist behaviors. It will be far easy to indulge in escapist behaviors. Find ways to limit your intake of things like alcohol, social media, television, sugar, staying up late, etc. Eight, prayer and fasting on Thursdays. We feel led to pray and fast during this time of fear and anxiety. We want to see God heal people in our city and restore the world around us. Join in on a fast on Thursday that takes place from Wednesday supper till Thursday supper. Number nine, community during the week. Continue to connect with your Lakeview Church community on a regular basis. Make a commitment to show up to the live stream of church and to maybe joining a home church. Number 10, Sabbath and worship on Sunday. Keep your routine to practice Sabbath or maybe start a new one for the first time and gather with us online every Sunday as we worship together, learn from the scriptures and create space for the spirit. Now, if you're anything like me, when you originally hear that list, it sounds like a lot. And I want to encourage you with this, that one of the pastors at this church has a quote that says, it doesn't matter if you choose to have a rule of life, you're going to have one. Meaning that if you don't go out of your way to choose to have a rule for how you decide to live your life during this time, society, culture, whatever, is going to pick one for you. 
And so it might seem daunting to take on all of these things, but actually in doing so, you're going to let go of the things that the world is already expecting of you to do or trying to train you to do. And here's the thing. If we want to keep the faith, it means that there's going to have to be some discipline, sacrifice, and practice. Just like how if I want to get better at golf, I need to go to the driving range and actually hit a club. In the same way as followers of Jesus, if we actually want to thrive in this time, if we actually want to grow closer to God and actually make an impact not only in our own lives to find our own peace and joy, but to others, we need to be able to be willing to have this rule of life. And so I want to encourage you to, to like the passage said, write this down. Um, just now you're going to have a link pop up in the chat. You can click it and there you will find the rules for life that I've just listed out. And I want you to actually print it and put it on your fridge or take a screenshot of it and make it the background on your phone. So that way, as you go about your day, you're reminded of this rule. And at the top of it, you're going to see the title, Keep the Faith. So that every time you read this list and look at it, you know it's not just a set of rules so that you can be religious, that it's actually a way that you are currently participating in keeping the faith during this time. Because we are all tempted to backslide right now. It's so easy to just sit on your couch, be, feel exhausted, read way too much news, watch TV, eat unhealthy, never get up and out, out of the house, to not pray, to not fast, to not read your Bible. It is way too easy to do those things right now, but we need to fight that urge and keep the faith. I know for me, adopting this in the last two weeks has completely changed my life. Before in COVID, I was depressed and felt absolutely terrible and anxious and exhausted. And I can honestly tell you that after adopting these things, although it was hard for the first two or three days, I now don't want to miss any of them because they bring so much life and joy to me. And so I want to encourage you to do the same, to take the risk, to keep the faith, to adopt these practices, and maybe I'll even see you on the golf